Welcome to the 170th episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney, and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. Welcome. I'm bringing you this episode live from my teaching kitchen in my office. I hope there's not too much of an um, echo in the background. Uh, won't be long anyway because we have a long interview today with Jeff Chilton. Jeff is a... Um, mushroom expert living in uh, the Washington State area. So you'll learn a lot about him and a tremendous amount about mushrooms. Uh, he is the president of a company uh, named Namex, N-A-M-M-E-X, and the website is namex.com. Namex uh, was the first company to offer a line of certified organic mushroom extracts um, into the United States nutritional supplement industry. Um, and uh, he is a wealth of knowledge, so I am sure you're going to enjoy this uh, tremendously. Again, I learned a tremendous amount about mushrooms during this interview. Um, before we get started, I just thought I'd uh, give you my usual update as far as my Ironman training, you know, swim, bike, run, weight lift, repeat. Uh, it's hot down in Florida still. I say it every week. It seems like it's getting hotter, but I guess I'm getting a little bit more used to it. Um, experimenting a little bit with, you know, uh, every year the hydration issue comes up. Uh, nutrition is the fourth discipline when it comes to triathlon uh, or any endurance sport because you can train all you want, but if your nutrition's not right after several hours, things can go haywire. Some things that I heard on other podcasts that kind of sent me reeling lately was about uh, taking in salt. You know, it's so hot down here and uh, people are afraid to get dehydrated. And one of the things that happens when you lose water uh, by sweating is you lose water and you lose sodium uh, and electrolytes, but you lose a lot more water than you do electrolytes. So what happens is your body, your blood becomes actually a little bit more viscous or thickened. So the idea is to resorb fluid from your intestinal tract and your stomach to make your um, blood uh, the right viscosity. If you put a bunch of salt uh, and electrolytes and a whole lot of sugar in your stomach, it actually draws water the other direction. And so you become, you get a bloated stomach, both the contents of your stomach, you get a lot of, you know, swishing around and it's like carrying a water balloon, but you also get edema of the stomach as well and the intestines so that you cannot absorb the water back into your bloodstream where it actually provides you benefit. And a lot of people think when they lose a weight when they're exerting themselves that it's all from the water that's in their system. But the reality of it is when we break down carbohydrate, along comes water as well. So we're not losing all the volume from our bloodstream uh, in, our, in our blood. A lot of it comes from the breakdown of the carbohydrate that's carrying water with it. So it's kind of a transient effect. So people that sweat while they're running um, don't become extremely dehydrated even when there is weight loss. So chasing this, you know, adding all this volume in uh, can be actually quite dangerous. And, and really the, the best rule of thumb is to drink when you're thirsty. And, you know, a lot of these supplement companies, you know, they're, they're very salty. The drink's very salty and sugary, and they make you more thirsty. And so you end up taking more and more fluids in because you're, it's, it's causing an abnormal thirst reflex. Now, that being said, that doesn't uh, necessarily um, help out with, you know, how do you get the calories in and, and not get sick at your stomach? And, and it's a challenge. Um, the, typically, uh, people try to, the recommendation is to try to get 150 to 200 calories in an hour, and it can be uh, somewhat difficult. You know, as a plant-based cardiologist, I don't like to just put in simple sugars if I can help it. Um, so I've been, you know, playing around with some baby food lately. So, it'd be, you know, banana, berry type, the baby food packages on the bike, and that seems, seems to help. They're not as transportable as some of these plain sugar gels, so that makes them a little bit more difficult. Um, I've also tried banana date water. So you take a banana and three dates and you put it in a blender with water and, and uh, make that thin. That always that tastes pretty good. Um, I've done a little chia seed with uh, water and some lime juice and um, a, a little cacao powder. Um, and I'm also trying uh, you know, some orange juice with some chia seed. 
and uh, perhaps a, a little maple syrup in that to kind of do a slow concentrated gel. Um, I also use a premix of a Scratch Lab for a, a slow uh, just hydration drink as well. But mainly rely on, uh, you know, I really want to try to rely on more on whole foods. So uh, as I experiment with some of these things, I'll, I'll let you know how it's going. So right now I am sticking with um, the baby food packs. Uh, that's a go for me. So, um, you know, that's, that's part of my nutrition. They're about 80 calories for package. Um, so, you know, obviously you need quite a bit, bit of them uh, for several hours. So I've, I've got to find something else to, to kind of substitute around. But I, I really want to say whole foods because if you, st if, or at least uh, natural foods, you know, such as dates and, and things like that, because then you're getting the electrolytes in kind of the way they were meant to be uh, hooked onto the food as opposed to just having electrolytes come in and sugar come in separately. So although we know that works in an IV intravenous feeding type setting, um, if I could get something to come in a little bit more naturally, um, I, I would like to do that. So that's, that's kind of where I am. The other thing, you know, uh, in Florida, it's mango season, and we're having great fun um, trying different varieties. There are, um, there are more varieties produced each year. Um, of different mangoes, different fibers. So if you go to your local grocery store, you may just have seen you know, the typical green and red uh, Kent mango. Sometimes they're a lot of, they're very fibrous. But, you know, try different mangoes out there. There's, you know, different, all kinds of flavor from, you know, having kind of coconut essence, pineapple essence, uh, to absolutely no fiber at all. So if you get a chance, try some different mangoes. They're loaded with um, vitamin C and antioxidants and uh, beta carotin. So that's a, it's a really great fruit, and um, it, it's really fun if you can get a hold of them uh, locally out of somebody's yard. Um, you don't have to worry about mangoes as far as the skin is thick. You don't eat the skin, so as far as pesticides, you don't have to worry about eating organic, and, and, and pests don't really bother them, so I don't think there's much in the way of spraying that's ever done on, on mangoes, so it's a really uh, good fruit to get a hold of. So I think what uh, we'll do, again, since this uh, interview is on the longish side for me, we'll, we'll get the interview started, and um, I, I hope you enjoy. Welcome, Jeff Chilton. Um, Jeff is a mushroom ex expert. Uh, he studied uh, ethnomycology at the University of Washington, and um, he is the foremost expert on mushrooms, and we're so excited to have him here to take us through from the basics of mushrooms all the way up to medicinal mushrooms as long as uh, time permits. So thank you, Jeff, for taking time to speak with us. Dr. Delaney, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So, you know, as part of my uh, nutrition classes here in my office, we go shopping together at the local supermarket and we look at portobello mushrooms and white mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. And so if we could just start at the very basics of mushrooms, you know, I tell people that stems are better than the top, but let's just start at the basics here a little bit and go through what do we see in the store and where did they come from and are they all created equal there on the shelf or not? Well, first let me say mushrooms are, are really a, a wonderful food. Uh, mushrooms have a um, substantial amount of protein for a vegetable, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. And, and remember, when I'm talking about, about the nutritional value of mushrooms, each mushroom is actually very different in terms of its nutritional value. So, so they'll have different amounts of protein, carbohydrates. So, but in general, mushrooms are 20 to 40 percent protein. They're... they're um, 40 to 80 percent of uh, carbohydrate, and that carbohydrate is high quality, what we would call polysaccharide, and we can talk about polysaccharides a little bit later. They they have a very good amount of B vitamins, uh, riboflavin, niacin, and thiamine, uh, some of which uh, would give you a decent amount of your daily recommended dose. Um, they're high in phosphorus and potassium and the other the other cool thing about mushrooms is actually they they have a lot of fiber and and, and that's part of the benefits is they are a, a prebiotic as well so a lot of that fiber goes down and feeds your microbiome so generally speaking and, and you know 
I always tell people the first thing they should do when it comes to mushrooms is, is uh, you know, they, they, we, we sell mushroom powders as supplements, but I always say to people, put mushrooms into your diet. They're really good. Now, in terms of, of what you're going to find at the market, uh, the button mushroom, the agaricus or portobello has been around for a long time. In fact, I actually started growing mushrooms in 1973 commercially on a very large farm. And it was an agaricus farm. And we produced uh, uh, close to 2 million pounds of agaricus every year. So we were a big farm. We also had a Japanese scientist there that was doing research and development on shiitake, oyster mushroom, enoki taki. I was so fortunate that I was able to be exposed to other mushrooms at that time. And, and, and all mushrooms are going to have beneficial properties. Some mushrooms will be more beneficial than others. And what I would say is shiitake mushroom is probably, if you want to start with one uh, mushroom that will cover a lot of bases for you in terms of nutritional and medicinal, shiitake would be the one. So you have shiitake in your marketplace absolutely love shiitake it's my favorite mushroom and i that's the one i i tell people put shiitake into your diet i eat mushrooms maybe three four five times a week and and let me tell you when i sit down and cook up mushrooms i will probably eat anywhere from 100 to 250 grams just in a sitting and I, I just love them. I think they're wonderful food, and I highly recommend to people that they put them into their diet. Now, is there something about um, eating a raw mushroom? Um, so let's look raw mushroom and then organic versus non-organic. Well, uh, when it comes to raw mushrooms, what I would say is, is that cooking mushrooms will help to break down the cell walls. Mm -hmm. So you will definitely get more of the nutrients from a cooked mushroom. The, uh, the agaricus mushroom, um, there is a compound in agaricus mushrooms called hydrazine, uh, and it occurs in very, very small amounts. And this, this hydrazine compound will be broken down with cooking. It's, there's not enough there for somebody to be really afraid of them at all or, or to figure that's going to be a real detriment, but that is something to be aware of. So I generally speaking, I would say cook your mushrooms, and not only that, um, I, I personally think the flavor comes out when you when you cook mushrooms. And let me give you a little secret about cooking mushrooms. Uh, I don't know how many people you've talked to, but I've talked to certainly a lot of people, and they say, "Oh yeah, mushrooms. They are soggy and slimy. I hate the things." Hmm. Well, the fact is, is that. When people cook them, a lot of times that's how they end up. So the key to, to, to cooking mushrooms is a very hot pan. In your choice of oil, whether it's just a regular cooking oil or I use butter, I put them in there. It's a hot pan. They fry up. What that does is it seals the moisture in because what happens is on a low heat, all that water, you know what, mushrooms are like, a lot of other vegetables, 90% water. So that water comes right out. Next thing you know, you've got these mushrooms that are cooking up in a, in a, uh, a puddle of water. So high heat, uh, I, like to, I like to actually cook them to where I will brown them. Don't, don't slice them too thin, uh, maybe a um, quarter of an inch thick, something like that. Brown them up on either side, cook them for a reasonable amount of time, maybe 10 minutes or something. And at that point, a little salt, a little pepper, they're delicious. Perfect. That sounds good. Well, in the plant-based nutrition world, as far as reversing disease, I try to get people not to use oil. So I'll tell people just to start out with minimal amounts of, <laughs> of water. Sure. Same, thing, same thing works. But that, that's good. Yep, yeah, that's, that's, that's very, very good. Now, um, one other thing, going back to the raw, just as a question, does marinating in a vinegar, uh, does that do anything to that hydrazine? Do you know? I, I do not know. And what I would say about the hydrazine is, is it's, you know, it occurs in such small amounts that somebody and, and it's a mutagen and, and somebody who's who's eating mushrooms um, and not eating them raw and cooking the mushrooms. That would really not be an issue. If it were an issue, 
uh, you wouldn't see that particular mushroom being sold in the marketplace. That's it's just that simple. So so I don't consider it a big issue, but okay. it, it is in there, and there have been people that have raised that as an issue, but. I consider it pretty much a, a non-issue. Okay, good. And then, you know, what about, uh, you know, should we look for organic versus um, non-organic? And this is going to, I guess, lead you into how mushrooms are produced. Well, you know what? I'm a firm believer in organic produce, or organic foods in general. Uh, I think, you know, that we all eat too many chemicals of whatever sort. I think organic agriculture also is very good in terms of the way they try to build the soils rather than deplete the soils. So I, I definitely support uh, organic agriculture. In fact, my company has been organically certified since 1992. Um, so so that, that's my uh, way of thinking. And I think and in terms of mushrooms, let me, let me say this about mushrooms. Generally speaking, agaricus and again, when I started growing mushrooms, and I, and I was, I worked on this farm for ten years. I know mushrooms intimately. I lived with mushrooms literally for ten uh, for ten years. We did spray a lot of chemicals on our mushroom crop, and and so mushrooms that are not organically produced will tend to have a reasonable amount of chemicals that have been used on them. So I, I would definitely. Um, wash them for sure and and just be aware of that and so if you could get organic mushrooms i would say definitely try and get organic mushrooms the one benefit in fact of shiitake mushrooms is that shiitake mushrooms are grown in a manner that don't need the same level of spraying that the agaricus mushrooms do and, and it's just a Agaricus mushrooms are produced in a way it's a long cropping cycle, so it's 90 days from start to finish. And during that cycle, there are certain times at which bugs and or other fungi can get involved and um, contaminate the crop. So that's that's one of the reasons why I think uh, if you can get organic, buy organic. Perfect. So, you know, let's let's go into this. Um, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the nutritional benefits. Um, you know, how, how did you get into the business of mushrooms? Well, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in the Seattle area and we're a climate up here that is very wet. Uh, and that means that we're very green also. So it's an evergreen area. I'm looking out right now in my environment, and all I see is, is trees that are just green as can be, and it's, it's quite a beautiful sight. So I had mushrooms all around me when I was growing up, and, and I was able to go out mushroom hunting when I was younger, and I just kind of uh, had a bit of a fascination with it. When I went to university, I uh, actually, my field of study was anthropology, but I, I still had this idea that it would be interesting to know more about mushrooms. So at the same time that I was studying anthropology, I took some courses in mycology, which is the study of, of fungi. And, and then what I found out was that mushrooms actually had been, because uh, I looked at it historically, they've been not only a food that's been out there for thousands and thousands of years, but they were also used by indigenous cultures in certain ways, including medicinally. So they're used medicinally and also in shamanic healing practices. So that sort of brought the two together for me. And in a sense, my my anthropological studies were in a way ethnomycology. So the use of mushrooms in uh, societies worldwide. So that that was pretty much how I, I got into it all. Well, let's let's go back to the hunting mushrooms. I did my training at the University of Pittsburgh, and at the time I was moonlighting in an emergency room, and it became a, a toxicology center. And the physicians um, that was in uh, was the chief there was actually a mushroom poison toxicologist. Um, sure, and you know. 
I also have Italian heritage and my grandparents used to go out and, and, you know, hunt mushrooms. And so they would say my, you know, the, the, the way the story got passed down is, you know, you put a nickel in this frying pan or something like that to be able to tell whether or not it was poisonous. And, and then this woman scared me to death. She said, you know, you can, you know, your liver, your liver will just go with one bad mushroom. So help me out here. You know, how does a boy go hunting mushrooms and come back alive? Well, the the best way to go out hunting mushrooms and come back alive is to go out with somebody that knows what they're doing and, and really knows what they're doing. And then the second part of that is when you eat a mushroom for the first time, uh, uh, and again, figuring that that's something that your well-versed friend has identified and knows and has eaten multiple times. Never eat a lot of any mushroom the first time you encounter it. Have a small amount, taste it, a few bites, see if you like it. And, and you know, some mushrooms actually, the, some mushrooms will cause uh, allergic reactions too. So, so the best thing to do is always to... to um, that I eat a small amount. And then, you know, every every major metropolis will have a mushroom club. And these societies will go out every fall and they will uh, have forays. They invite the public to come along with them. You can join them in the uh, in Seattle and uh, Vancouver, Canada. Well, the mycological societies there every year they will have a show and at that show the society members will will bring in mushrooms from all over uh, that they've tracked down they'll bring them in they'll lay them out on tables they'll identify them for you and at those shows you can begin to learn about the different mushrooms in your neighborhood that are edible and and here's the thing there are certain mushrooms that are fairly easy to identify and what you want to do is you always want to focus on, let's just say, one species, learn that one species so that you know it well. You, there's, you know that there's no look at, lookalikes you have to be worried about. And, and then you can pick that mushroom with uh, uh, um, some kind of confidence. And then every year as you go along, you can maybe learn about another mushroom or something. Generally speaking, you might end up with, let's just say, five primary mushrooms that you you know about. You can go out and you can harvest. And, and there's a few other things, of course, that you have to think about. One is, look, mushrooms like any other fruit or vegetable, they, uh, they mature they go over the hill and start to break down. So when you're mushroom hunting, only pick the, the mushrooms you find that are in perfect, excellent condition. I go out with mushroom with, with people often mushroom hunting and some people that haven't been out often. And they're always, always wondering why I'm leaving so, mushroom, so many mushrooms behind. Well, I'm looking at them and I'm going, you know what, that one's either immature or it's a little bit too mature, in which case actually bacteria will, will start to break it down. Um, sometimes mushrooms, wild mushrooms can be very waterlogged. You don't want to take those. The, the flavor will be diluted. So, And the other thing, too, is you, you know who actually gets uh, poisoned more often in the United States are immigrants. People that come in, they remember back from the old country and they, they remember eating certain mushrooms back there. They go out mushroom hunting, and they, they come ac- across a, a flush of, let's say, very beautiful, meaty-looking mushrooms, and they think, oh, that's something that we used to eat back home. They'll gather them up. They'll take them home. They will eat a bunch of them. And next thing you know, and here's the thing that is is so difficult about mushroom poisoning is the the major poisoning out there uh, will, uh, in certain mushrooms, it will not even show up for eight hours. Mm. So you don't even know you've been poisoned. Everything seems fine. Eight hours later, you get violently ill. And at that point, the poison has gotten so far that it, you, there's no coming back. And so it's very difficult, especially if somebody's eaten um too many of these uh, mushrooms 
in that meal uh, because they are liver toxins. They will they will destroy your liver. They'll destroy your kidneys, major organ toxins. So it's not something to be taken lightly at all. Well, good. I, you know, I certainly don't want to give the. Uh you know, it's like, okay, let's all go out and see what we can find and eat everything's in the grass, yeah. Oh, no, 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 never, ever do that. In fact, I always tell people, look, if you don't know know any, anything about mushrooms, if you're, you know, going out mushroom hunting for whatever reason, do not eat what you found unless you're with somebody or that knows mushrooms very, very well. And again, again, the, for the people that are interested and want to do it, Find your local mycological society because if you're in a major metropolis, it will be there and go out with them. They know what they're doing. They can point you to the the high quality uh, mushrooms in your area, and that's that's really the way to start. Great, great. Um, so, what are the what are medicinal mushrooms, and you know, does it mean eating the mushroom proper or mushroom extracts? And you know, now um, I've purchased mushroom uh, coffees, uh, and and you know, had those. Um, you know, so let's let's move into what you can do with mushrooms a little bit. Well, mushrooms have a cell wall that is made up, uh, 50% of the cell wall of that mushroom is made up with a compound called a beta-glucan. And, and the beta-glucan has been researched in great, great detail over the last 30 or 40 years, and it has been demonstrated both in in vitro and in vivo as having immunological activity. It stimulates the growth of uh, macrophages, uh, natural killer cells. So it actually is uh, will is what's called a, a immunological potentiator. So it will stimulate the the activity, the production of immune cells. So so in that sense, every mushroom has these beta glucan so every mushroom has a little bit of that activity but the difference is is that these beta glucans that make up the mushroom cell walls they have a little bit different architecture so certain mushrooms will be what i might call a major medicinal mushroom like a shiitake or a maitake or a reishi mushroom they have a beta-glucan architecture that has a high level of activity, whereas other mushrooms will not have that same architecture. Their, their beta-glucan architecture will be um, different enough that those activities don't show up. And just to give you an example, I have a book that's called Icons of Medicinal Mushrooms. It comes from China, and in China they have identified 270 different species that have shown in scientific tests to have some activity. Now, what I do in my company in terms of that is, you know, 270 different mushrooms. Now, no, that's that's not something that, that you know, again, they will have different levels of activity. So I look at, okay, what mushrooms have been used traditionally in traditional Chinese medicine, because that's where a lot of this uh, uh, traditional use has come from. Well, look, what, what, what are the ones that traditionally have been used? And, and there's maybe about eight or ten species that have been commonly used in traditional Chinese medicine. So those are the ones that, that actually um, science has um, demonstrated to us. And that, that's the second part of this, is you look at traditional Chinese uh, medicine use, and then you go, okay, what does the scientific literature have to tell us? What have the scientists done with these specific mushrooms that demonstrate it has or, or doesn't have activity? And so you look at that, and, and if there is a body of research out there regarding a, a certain species, then I would say, okay, this is a, this is an important medicinal species, and and again, um, although there's 270 list, listed, traditional Chinese medicine has used about, I would say, 10 to 20 different mushrooms in certain ways, but there's only about 10 that I would call 
major medicinal mushrooms. And and here's here's what's really interesting about it is that is that science uh, they will do um, these in vitro or in vivo studies where you'll actually look for some kind of a, a response from either the the test the type of test they're using or the animal tests that they're doing. And, and a lot of it has been revolved around um, anti-cancer studies. So they'll use different tumor systems with animals and or uh, in vitro to see if there's any activity. And 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 when in, in my company, what I do, because I don't have the, the means to do those kind of studies, but I look at that research and then I look at tests, methods that can for example, show me, okay, what is the level of beta-glucan in this product? Um, I look at tests where I can actually uh, come up with results that show me, okay, these specific medicinal compounds occur in this product at a certain level, and those become very important to me in terms of actually determining the quality of the particular mushrooms or mushroom extracts that I'm selling in my business. So, so A, these, these particular mushroom mushrooms have a lot of scientific research behind them, and, and a lot of it is very solid. Uh, a lot of it's from Japan, uh, where they have a very large mushroom industry, so they've done a lot of work in Japan. There's a lot of work that's been done uh, in Europe. There's some work that's been done in the United States. A lot of work that's been done in China. We have to be very careful about looking at any of this scientific research, where it comes from, who sponsors it. Uh, but the body of data out there regarding the medicinal qualities of these mushrooms is is quite strong. And and again, the key uh, the key compound in mushrooms is, are these beta glucans, and they are a polysaccharide, and and polysaccharides. Uh, in my opinion, are one of the things that we don't get a lot of in our diets because a lot of the diet we have over here is a lot of monosaccharides and refined sugars, which are not really great for us. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, so, so when, you know, when we're looking at, you know, what, um, you know, it, it stimulates the uh, immune system. And so when we talk about people that, you know, we want to put on an anti-inflammatory diet, um, these will be very helpful in, as far as to um, get the immune system under control, correct? Yes, yes, indeed. In fact, the, the one of the things I think that, that they, they, talk about when they're talking, when scientists talk about medicinal mushrooms, what they're talking about to some degree is, is creating a homeostasis. So really it's, it's trying to, to modulate the immune system to where we've got a, a better balance. I, I think, you know, certainly the way I look at health to a large degree, and I think this, this is probably true of a lot of traditional type of like uh, traditional Chinese medicine stuff is, is balance and trying to bring the organism into balance that, that there's something going on that has thrown us out of balance. And, and as you know, certainly diet is one of those things that can really throw people out of balance and, and, uh, put them off. And, and of course, taking, uh, taking something like, like eating mushrooms or taking a mushroom supplement is not going to, not going to help you if you still continue on with those same, same particular habits. But, um, that's how I look at mushrooms. It's something that is going to help to, to keep us uh, or help us to maintain a homeostasis. When, you know, we talk about some of these elixirs or, you know, coffees that are made from mushrooms, um, you know, one of the, some of the ones that come up are chaga, lion's mane, um, you, you know, from one company to another, how do we know, you know, um, is there going to be that mushroom extract in there? Um, you know, is there one to look for if you want, if somebody wanted to try a, you know, uh, a mushroom coffee or something along that line, you know, where would, you know, where would people start? I should, should say. <laughs> well, you know what, that, that's such a good question because I have to tell you that the, you know, it's one thing to go out there and look at food it's another when you're dealing with just a powder of some sort. And I've, 
I've uh, experienced that in my own business. I mean, you look at you look at somebody offers you something for sale, and they and you look at it and you say, well, that's nothing more than a brown powder. And, and so, uh, he, here's what's really going on in in my category. Uh, this mushroom part of nutritional supplements and and all is uh, in, in 2015. I actually did a very detailed study. It's called it's called redefining medicinal mushrooms. And what I did is I took the actual dried mushroom, I took a, a mushroom extract made from those dried mushrooms, and then I bought 40 commercial products right off the internet from various sources so that I would just have the, the bottle product from wherever. And a lot of the bottle products that I bought were products that were called um, or, or were actually what's called mycelium. And, and this is something that that people need to understand about uh, a mushroom. A mushroom is just a plant part. A mushroom is one stage of a fungal organism. And the fungal organ organism would start with not a seed. It's not a plant. It has spores. So spores out in nature will germinate. Those uh, germinated spores will ultimately come together and fuse, and they will form a network a network, and this network is a very fine filaments that we normally don't see because they're in the ground, they're in pieces of wood, but they're out there. And what they're doing, actually, in mushrooms and fungi in general, they're decomposers. They're out there decomposing all the, the organic litter that's all around us and then breaking it down along with bacteria, ultimately to a humus. So, so we've got a spore, we've got this mycelium. The mycelium, what it actually does is it, as it's breaking down all of this organic matter, it is building up uh, stores of energy, which ultimately when, when the season is right, a mushroom will pop up. And that mushroom is actually what, what some people would call a fruiting body of this mycelial body, which is a vegetative body. So you have a a spore. The spore produces this fine, these fine filaments, which become a, a mycelium. That mycelial network produces a mushroom. The mushroom matures, drops the spores, and the life cycle at that point is is complete. Well, what what has happened out there? Growing mushrooms is very expensive. Uh, you know, even even at the store, a lot of people say, "Oh, gee, mushrooms are expensive," and and when you start buying shiitake or some other mushroom like that, you'll say, yeah, that is pretty expensive. Garica's not so bad, but growing mushrooms is a very complex and expensive, which, which is why very few people are growing mushrooms at home, because it's not as easy as putting a seed in the ground and watching a plant come up. It's not easy at all. It's an expensive business. So what companies will do in the United States primarily is they will take that mycelium, that vegetative stage, and they can they can actually grow out that fine white fuzzy mycelium. They can grow it out on a sterile grain. So we we took all these products and we we knew the ones that were the mycelium grown on grain products. The problem with those products is that that after that mycelium has colonized that grain, they essentially will take that, that and they will dry it and grind it to the powder, but, but they will never remove the grain. So those myceliated grain products end up being mostly starch ah. from the grain. Now, now here's, here's the thing that is, is difficult for people out there. When they sell these products, Dr. Delaney, what they do is they actually call them mushroom. Mm. So, so when you go out there into the store and look look at these products on the shelves, they'll all say shiitake mushroom, reishi mushroom, maitake mushroom, and they'll have a picture of a mushroom on the label. But what a lot of those products are is this grain powder that has got mycelium in it. And so what our study showed us and what we did is we measured all of these products for beta-glucans. And, and the, the test that we did for beta-glucans also tested what are called alpha-glucans. Alpha-glucans are the starches. So, so uh, a mushroom doesn't have starch. So when you measure 
in this beta-glucan test, the mushroom is very high in beta-glucans. It's anywhere from 25 to 50 percent beta-glucan. That's what we're looking for. That's what we want. So the dried mushroom or the mushroom extract had these beta-glucans in them at that level. When you measured this myceliated grain, what you found was the beta-glucan content was very, very low, around maybe 5% as the mean and the alpha-glucan. Mushrooms don't have starch, so the alpha-glucan in the mushroom was was 1 or 2 or 3%. The alpha-glucan in these myceliated grain products was actually anywhere from 30 to 60%. Mm. So, so what you actually had was you had a product that was mostly grain powder being sold as a mushroom. And let me give you a, a, a way to picture this. I don't know if you are familiar with a product called tempeh. Yes. Tempeh is fungal mycelium grown on cooked soybeans. Okay, that is that is essentially what these companies are growing, but they dry it to a powder, uh, they dry it, grind it to a powder, and then they sell it as a mushroom. It's not a mushroom at all. It is simply a tempeh-like product that has been dried and ground to a powder. So this is what this is what my study demonstrated. And let me tell you, it really shook up the whole industry because, in a sense, a lot of these products were being mislabeled. And not only that, they didn't have the compounds in them that we're looking for. So, well, when you go out into the marketplace looking at a supplement or you, or even your mushroom coffee, you may think you're getting a mushroom coffee. Let me tell you, you very well may not be. There may not be any mushroom in that coffee at all. And, and that's something that that is, for me, as uh, certainly as a mushroom grower from way back and as uh, somebody who's in a business that actually sells genuine mushroom products, well, uh, to me, that, that's uh, unethical. But again, you know, you know what happens? It's one of these issues where, where it's not killing anybody. <laughs> and so FDA doesn't really get involved or FTC and they're, they're in more something that's more uh, dangerous to people's health. People may be taking these things, but they're not getting any benefits, but it's not harming them. Unless, you, unless you're really allergic to grains of some sort, then maybe there would be a problem there. But, but basically, they're not doing you any good. You're not getting the benefits of a genuine medicinal mushroom product. And so that's something where my company, what I really believe in, I believe in, in scientific analysis of my products. I, I, I believe in that for all nutritional supplements. There should be testing that will at least validate the fact that you've got the active compounds in whatever it is you're selling. And, and today we're doing a lot more uh, DNA analysis. And, and just to give you a, an example of something, we, we not only use a beta-glucan test to test other products, but we also will, will use DNA tests. We did a DNA test recently of a chaga product, and and we tested for we tested the chaga product for beta glucans along with a couple others, and and it turned out that um, it had 55 percent beta glucan. Well, we know from years of testing that chaga products are are very low in beta glucans, and they're only about 10 percent beta glucan. So we right away suspected something about this Chaga product was really wrong. And so at that point, we sent it off for DNA analysis. And we, we asked them to test not only for Chaga, we asked them to test for uh, um, Saccharomyces yeast. They, they, the results came back. It turned out that there was absolutely no chaga in that product. There wasn't a single DNA sequence for chaga. There was, however, many, many sequences for Saccharomyces. So the company that had manufactured that product actually was selling yeast, calling it chaga. And, and, and there were other contaminants in there as well, including buckwheat. Wow. Well, think about that for a second. Uh, when you've got products out there, how does one work their way through? 
There's a couple of things that I would recommend to people in terms of when you're looking for a genuine mushroom product, one of which is taste it. These products that are myceliated grain, if you pour it out and taste it, it will taste bland. It will taste a bit like grain, sometimes even a little bit sweetish. And the other thing you can do, which I love, is the, the um, iodine starch test. Iodine, if you take two or three capsules, you dump it out into a quarter cup of water, mix it up really good, uh, buy a little bottle of iodine, a couple bucks at the pharmacy, put 10 drops of iodine into that water. If it is starch, it will turn black immediately. Wow. <laughs> wow, I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's shocking. Let me tell you, it is absolutely shocking. And... Many of the companies selling these products, they know better, but, but here's the issue. And this, is, this is, makes it even worse in a way. The issue is that, that if I grow mushrooms and I take them to the, the supermarket and I'm a grower and I take them to the supermarket and they give me $5 for my, let's just say, my pound of fresh shiitake mushrooms and then they sell for 10 Okay, fine. Fresh mushrooms, no problem. But supplements are sold as a dry powder. So you take the water out of that pound of shiitake mushrooms and now instead of now instead of like a um, thousand milligrams you, you're down to like only 10. So you've got you've got that five dollar pound of shiitake mushrooms. Now you have to get fifty dollars for that pound. Mm. The economics don't work. So they cannot grow the mushrooms, dry the mushrooms, and sell them into the supplement market. It just absolutely doesn't work economically. So in the United States, and, and that's what I'd say too, one of the, one of the ways if you're, if you're looking at a supplement is, is where was it produced? Was it produced in the United States? Well, if it was, it's most likely going to be myceliated grain, and, and you're going to be getting nothing from it, and, and it could be relatively expensive to buy that product. And 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 here's here's I actually realized this back in the 80s. I started my company in 1989, but I grew mushrooms uh, commercially from 1973 to to 1989. I know the economics of it all. And and in 1989, I went to China and I I traveled throughout China for the next 10 years. I went to conferences. I visited farms. I visited research institutes. I made a tremendous number of contacts there. And I realized that, A, they were, China China right now is responsible for 85% of the world's mushrooms. 85%. Um, of course, we all, and a lot of people look at China and they go, I'd never eat anything from China. <laughs> I, I understand that completely. I'd never eat anything that was grown on the Gulf Coast of the United States. <laughs> So, so in 1997, I went to China and I organized with a, a probably the largest organic certification company in the United States. I brought them to China with me. We organized the very first organic certification workshop for mushrooms in China, 1997. Today, we have tons and tons and tons of mushrooms in China that are organically certified, not by Chinese certifiers by high quality German certifiers. And we test, for example, our products when we manufacture them, when we grow them and turn them into extract powders, we test them for heavy metals, we test them for pesticides, microbes. They all get tested before they even leave China. When they come over, we will test them again. I really believe in testing. Not only that, I can't even sell my products unless they meet pesticide standards, unless they meet heavy metal standards, I have to supply all my customers with a certificate of analysis that demonstrates that I've tested our products and they meet these standards. They have to meet those standards. So, so for me, I'm bringing an ethic to China. I, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going over there and saying, look, I can't grow mushrooms and sell them as supplements in the United States. I'll go over to China. I'll work with you. I'll bring you a new ethic. And uh, isn't it a better thing, ultimately, to help other countries reach a higher standard? Yeah, I, I think it's great. Can I, 
uh, you know, it brought up a, uh, to mind, you know, at my local, one of my local farmers market, um, you know, they sell, you know, well, you, you say, so any mushroom for the most part, 85% of all, even commercial mushrooms in the United States are grown in China. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. What Medicinal I'm saying. Medicinal mushrooms. No, well, yeah. Well, no, what I'm saying is this. I'm saying that, um, certainly the mushroom, the fresh mushrooms that you're buying in the United States are grown in the United States. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is the supplements that are being sold in the United States, if they are, you can't, you can't produce a mushroom supplement. You can, however, and what companies do in the United States is they grow this mycelium stage and they grow it in a sterile laboratory. They grow it out on grain, and they don't grow a single mushroom there. They grow this mycelium on the grain. At the end of the process, they will dry that myceliated grain. Again, think of tempeh. Mm-hmm. They'll just take that tempeh-like product. They'll dry it. They'll grind it to a powder. They'll put it in capsules, bottles, and they'll sell it as a mushroom supplement gotcha. when, in fact, it is not mushroom. It is the mycelium stage that has been grown on grain like tempeh, and they don't remove the grain from the final product. So most of that, pro- if you look at tempeh, for example, you slice it up and all that, you see all this sort of whitish, and that's mycelium, but you can see all the soybeans that are still there. The soybeans are the, the major part of that product. Mm-hmm. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Um, just as a side note, like the king oyster mushrooms and things like yep. that that are coming yep. from China, um, are, are the, is the pesticides in general from those kind of mushrooms as bad as, you know, would you stay away from those or not? Well, you know what? Um, king oysters, I've been to a, a king oyster farm in China and I do not think they used any chemicals at all on that farm. And and that particular farm I went to, and, and there's others probably just like it, um, it was one of the most modern farms I've ever seen in my lifetime. I mean, it was fantastic, and there was absolutely no need for them to use any chemicals whatsoever. So I would say those would be pretty safe. Um, you know, the ones that you have to worry about more than anything else are, are the the fresh agaricus mushrooms in the United States in terms of the amount of chemicals that would be used on those. They're getting better. They're much better than when I was growing back in the 70s. Oh, my God, you cannot imagine the, the amount of chemicals that we put on the crop to try and protect it from insects. It was it was really, really bad. They've, they've come a long way. So they're much better now. And the chemist I, chemical use on agaricus in the United States is probably not too bad. I'd still look for organic mushrooms. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the the the, the uh, uh, fruits out there that you think about. My understanding is that strawberries are terrible when it comes to pesticide use. So there's certain crops that, yeah, it's there's a lot of it on there. But no, in terms of fresh mushrooms, uh, there's not a lot of fresh mushrooms coming from China into the United States. There are some. Um, if you're getting king oysters, by the way, I love king oyster. Oh, That's I do too. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> yeah, no wonder you asked me the question. Yeah, it's all personal. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, it's delicious. It is absolutely so much better than the the normal oyster mushroom. No, it's it's one of my favorite mushrooms. It's got that very sweet flavor. The texture is nice and solid and firm. Great mushroom. Yeah, great. Oh, great. Well, fantastic. So, and so tell me, um, what exactly um, your your company is? Does this go into your company a little bit? Uh, what exactly you're doing then? Well, you know what? I was one of the very first companies in North America to sell medicinal mushrooms. Uh, my company was started in 1989, there wasn't a single herbal company out there, you know, the herbal companies that sell every herb you can think of, and they put it out as supplements. There wasn't a single company that had had mushrooms at all in their product line. And so I was walking around some of the natural food expos with a reishi mushroom in my hand, which a reishi mushroom, you look at it and you're like, what is that? And and I'd I'd show it to them and they go, that's a piece of wood. And I'm, well, yes, uh, it's very woody, but it's not a piece of wood. It's a real mushroom. And they were just like flabbergasted. And and uh, it took me years 
to actually convince companies. And again, I supply raw materials. I supply bulk powders to companies that they will then put into capsules, bottles, put their label on it. So I'm selling to them. And it took years and it took articles. It took books, uh, had to get information out there years to basically get uh, mushrooms into the product lines of all these herbal companies to where they would use them. They would put them into their, their, uh, product lines as supplements. And, and the interesting thing about it is that, you know, that that's 1989 when I started my company. Now here it is, it's like 30 years later and all of a sudden mushrooms are like, you just see articles about mushrooms everywhere. Mushrooms are trending. There's mushroom coffee, there's mushroom tea, there's mushroom chocolates, the mushrooms are being put into, you cannot imagine the things that our customers use the different products that they put mushrooms into. They're, they've trended uh, really high, and now they're considered sort of like one of the new superfoods. And personally, I, I agree. I, I think mushrooms are a superfood. However, and let me just be very clear about this, there is also a tremendous amount of hype on the internet for mushroom products, and I do not like it at all. I do not like it when people are hype, hyping up, like chaga. Right now, you go out there and you look about look at chaga, and it's like the king of mushrooms. Um, it's a panacea. There's nothing it doesn't do. I, I'm totally against that kind of marketing. I, and and I, it's totally false. It's not a panacea. It doesn't do everything. It's not the king of mushrooms. <laughs> in my career, <laughs> in my career... Dr. Delaney, I've literally experienced four different kings of mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so three of them have been deposed to now get to Chaga. <laughs> yeah, we'd like to find something, whether it's a pill or a mushroom, that would cure everything. And, uh, oh, you know, it, my uh, God. I know. It's, it's like searching for the Holy Grail or, or you know, the... The lost city of this or that. I mean, it's it's it, it's very much in our psyche to be thinking there is that silver bullet or magic bullet out there, isn't it? Yes, it, it is. Well, this has been uh, certainly extremely edu- educational uh, for me and uh, uh, all all the listeners. And uh, you know, it is a fascinating field. And you know, a, a lot of people that follow this, you know, are, are looking for ways to better their health and. Um, you know, if, if I, if I take you right, you know, from a few, a few points, um, you know, if we're going to eat raw mushrooms or cook raw, you know, uh, mushrooms whole, then the sh- shiitake is a good way to go if we can get a hold of it. What about, um, you, you know, and, uh, and, and, um, you know, it's good to eat them and, and be, and be careful when we're looking at supplements because, uh, they just may not be as all supplements as, as what they're seeing. What about dried? Buy, what about dry, buying dried mushrooms? So if you can find an organic dried um, mushroom, uh, say a, a, a maki versus um, uh, the fresh. Well, you know what? Dried mushrooms are great. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with dried mushrooms, except at times the price. Yes. <laughs> if you if you're not like I am on the west coast of North America, where we have a very large Chinatown, and I can go to the Chinatown and I can buy I can buy a pound of dried shiitake for as little as $20, and that will last a long time. I mean, that's a lot of shiitake mushrooms, whereas I've also gone into supermarkets, and I've seen where they're for for $4, they're selling 15 grams of some dried mushroom. And I look at that, and I go, who buys that? that that's, that's not even enough for one you know, for the garnish in a meal or something in, uh, in a meal. So, so unless you have access to uh, a outlet that sells dried mushrooms for a reasonable price, then I would just uh, stay with the fresh. And again, what I say to most people is start out by getting fresh mushrooms into your diet. 
shiitake especially agaricus is good too if you like agaricus buy agaricus as well uh, put mushrooms into your diet too you know eat them two or three times a week don't be shy i mean i i again like i said i can sit down and i can eat i can eat <laughs> half a pound of of fresh mushrooms fried up in some way easily, you know. Sometimes they don't even make it out of the pan. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will. I, I, I can't eat a steak without it being covered in mushrooms. It's just like that to me. I, I love mushrooms, and I think they're a great food. Um, uh, shiitake is a wonderful mushroom. I highly recommend shiitake. If you if you have um, even. Uh, oyster mushrooms are good. The, the king trumpet, like yours, you're talking about, man. If you've got that in your local markets, grab it. And especially, you know, if there's farmers markets where you've got small producers out there producing, support them, buy their mushrooms. You know, I mean, um, so so yes, put them into your diet before you even think about supplementing. Get them into your diet, and, and you know, with supplementation, really for me, it's a matter of if you if you really feel like you're out of balance if you really feel like your immunity is low you're maybe you're tired maybe you're you're you feel weak or something like well we'll try a mushroom supplement see if that if that helps and and don't be shy and be sure you get the right kind be sure it's actually genuine and and don't be shy about taking you know a couple grams of it up you know the problem with supplements these days is it's like they they give you 60 capsules and they say take two a day. Well, what is that? That's a month's supply. That's how they do it, and they they sell it as if everybody weighs the same. It's like you know, no, you you have to go. Well, you know, you should probably be taking more than what it tells you to take. I mean, just because oftentimes they they're not giving you enough, and that's why we produce extracts. We concentrate the mushroom down to where if you're buying it in supplement form, you're getting, uh, let's just say, four kilos that's been concentrated into one kilo or 10 kilos that have been concentrated into one kilo. We're, we're concentrating it down because we want to get the actives in there, enough actives when you're taking, let's say, two capsules because we know if it were two capsules of dried mushroom powder, that would just not do anything for you whatsoever. Great. Well, again, I thank you for taking time. It was, uh, you know, uh, very, very informative, and uh, look forward to maybe speaking to you again and uh, get some get 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 some more education. We'll go on to the <laughs> the level two hundred two course, perhaps. <laughs> that sounds just great, yeah. And it's my pleasure speaking to you as well. And, and I, I want you to know too. I looked at your website, and, and I I just think it's wonderful because I. I'm a total believer in food as medicine, as food, the diet being the really the key to good health and uh, diet and good exercise. And I mean, it's just so important. Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to meet you. All right. All Goodbye. right. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Jeff uh, Chilton. I know I did, and I, again, I, I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, again, check out his website, namex.com, and uh, as well as realmushrooms.com. You know, what he said about the supplement industry applies to all supplements, and, and that's for the most part why I, I really prefer whole foods, you know. So I, I love that, that, you know, he's like, eat your shiitake mushrooms, eat your mushrooms, eat organic mushrooms when you can, eat the dried mushrooms, rehydrate them when you can. Um, because su the supplement industry, you, you really have to be careful because you just don't know exactly where they came, where the product came from and, and the ethics behind it. So you have to be, you know, really careful. And then the other thing is, you know, what does the extract or the powder have to offer that the whole mushroom itself doesn't, you know, or the whole uh, whatever it is that it's being a supplement doesn't, you know, offer. And, and uh, oftentimes eating the whole food is is really the, the best way to go. And in most instances it is. Uh, but do check out uh, the website so you can and continue to learn. 
Um, you know, I, I think it's it's really, uh, if you're thinking about foraging for mushrooms, or maybe you do, you know, be really, really careful because, the you know, the, the liver toxicity, because it sets in so late, can really be an issue. So make sure that you have a trusted guide or somebody that really educates you um, uh, to know what, what you're looking for. If you have any questions, uh, please email uh, me at jamie at drdelaney.com. It's D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y, and Jamie is J-A-M-I. I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions um, or uh, comments. That would be great. Please check out the website at drdelaney.com. Um, all the podcasts that we've done uh, now of 170 are there, as well as recipes and uh, about our practice. Um, you know, we, we do three nutrition classes here in uh, our test kitchen a week, educating people on whole food, plant-based, no salt, sugar, oil uh, uh, nutrition, and have had a tremendous amount of success uh, in reversing lifestyle diseases and insisting people on learning. Because it's, it's not easy to, you know, when people first decide to go plant-based. Certainly the world is kind of tilted against you a little bit uh, with what's out there. And um, it's, it's a, it's, there's a learning curve. So it, it often helps to, um, to speak with somebody or be involved in a group. And uh, we do offer online programs uh, to assist you if you have an on- online consultations uh, with myself. And, and with our registered dietitian. So if you have any questions about that, please feel free to email me or Addie at drdelaney.com or the general info at drdelaney.com. So until next time, eat plants strong, get out and move, and enjoy this beautiful summer weather. Thank you very much for listening.